Hi kids, today we're going to read the book, What's the Big Deal About First Ladies? by Ruby Shamir and Matt Faulkner. Close your eyes for a moment and imagine if one of your parents became the President of the United States. What would your first day in the White House feel like? One first kid invited friends over for a massive scavenger hunt. Other kids ransacked the freezer for ice cream left inside, and some became convinced that the giant mansion was haunted. One thing is certain, there'd be a lot of changes in store for you and your family. No doubt your parents would try to help you get used to your new home, but they'd be really busy too. If your dad was elected president, your mom might be the first lady of the United States. One of the most famous women in the world. Everyone knows that being president is a major job. But what about being first lady? What's the big deal about first ladies anyway? Nellie Taft was the first lady to ride with her husband after he took his oath of office, promising to serve the country faithfully. Michelle Obama, the first African-American first lady, danced with President Obama at many inaugural balls, celebrating his swearing in. Do you think it would be fun to stay up late and party at a ball? Nancy Reagan held the Bible at a swearing in for President Reagan, which had to be moved indoors because of the freezing cold weather. Ladies first, who is the first lady? Every president of the United States so far has been a man, and almost every first lady has been a woman married to the president. First ladies have been mothers and grandmothers, sisters and aunts, teachers, lawyers, and even dancers. Some never attended formal schools, while others studied for many, many years. No two first ladies did the job in the same way, but every first lady was a partner to the president and left her mark. As Americans' first first lady, no one knew what to call Martha Washington. After a long revolutionary war breaking away from the King of England, one thing was sure, America would never have a ruler who couldn't be voted out. George Washington refused to become king and Martha would not be a queen. Julia Grant was the first first lady to issue a special notice to journalists called a press release. She gave interviews and opened up White House events to curious reporters. When Lucretia Garfield appeared on a poster for her husband's presidential campaign, she was one of the first wives to do so. Carrie Harrison lived in the White House when electric lights were first installed, and she was scared she'd get zapped by the switches. First ladies certainly aren't afraid of that these days. Women in America aren't always allowed, weren't always allowed to do things that men were. For a long time, women couldn't vote, own land, attend most colleges, or have certain kinds of jobs. That wasn't fair at all, but over time, women fought for those rights and won. And as women gained more rights, first ladies got much busier. The first time a first lady did something new, it was a big deal. But after a while, it became part of the job. What if the president's wife didn't want to be a first lady or couldn't? What if he didn't have a wife? Not every president's wife did his job. Sometimes she was too ill or in a few cases, the president wasn't married at all. When that happened, daughters, daughter-in-law, aunts, nieces, or sisters took over. Imagine if someone in your family really did become president and you got to help run the White House. Hi, I'm Abby, number one. Hi, I'm Emily, number two. Hi, I'm Molly, number three. Hi, I'm Harriet, number four. Hi, I'm Angelica, number five. Hi, I'm Priscilla, number six. Hi, I'm Mary, number seven. Hi, I'm Patsy, number eight. Hi, I'm Jane, number nine. Hi, I'm Abby, number 10. Hi, I'm Mary, number 11. Hi, I'm Martha, number 12. Hi, I'm Betty, number 13. So these are all the different people who were um, first ladies who were not um, the president's wives. So there was Jane Pierce's aunt, Rachel Jackson's niece, Ellen Arthur's sister-in-law, James Buchanan's niece, Hannah Van Buren's daughter-in-law, Letitia Tyler's daughter-in-law, Eliza Johnson's daughter, Martha Jefferson's daughter, Anna Harrison's daughter-in-law, Abigail Fillmore's daughter, 
Carrie Harrison's daughter, Eliza Johnson's daughter, and Peggy Taylor's daughter. What's the first lady's job? First ladies have a lot to do. They give the president advice, meet with people to try to help them, visit foreign lands and leaders, write books, make speeches, and much more. First ladies didn't always do all of those things, but one job that every single first lady had to do is host guests at the White House. You can say this makes her the, host, the hostess in chief. So at Julia Tyler's grand fin final ball, there were 1,000 candles and 3,000 people came to her party. Uh, Ida McKinley insisted on hosting events even when she was ill and often was carried into receptions and laid out on pillows. What was the first lady's job? Well, a long time ago, women weren't allowed to attend parties at the White House hosted by men unless there was an official hostess present, a woman to welcome and entertain them. Crazy, but true. This says because of a ban on alcohol drinks at the White House, Lucy Hayes later got the nicknamed Lemonade Lucy. What's the big deal about hosting parties anyway? Hosting parties sounds like a lot of fun, but it can be lots of work too. Remember your last birthday? Maybe you and your parents planned a theme, made decorations, hung them all over the house, thought up a menu, cooked the food, baked a cake, prepared goodie bags, Maybe made sure your guests were having a good time. The to-do list went on and on. First ladies are in charge of huge events several times a week for hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. And a lot of times the guests don't get, don't get along. So first ladies have to make sure that these events are so much fun that enemies put aside their differences. Can you imagine hosting more than 100 birthday parties each year for kids who don't always like one another? One of the things that made Frances Cleveland so popular was that she hosted special receptions on Saturdays so that working women could attend. Mary Todd Lincoln opened the White House to thousands of guests. Unfortunately, sometimes visitors thought they could take home a piece of history. During receptions, people sometimes tried to steal pieces of the carpets, curtains, and even the buttons off of Mary's dresses. Would you try Dolly Manson's oyster ice cream? Dancing wasn't allowed at Sarah Polk's White House. Sometimes White House entertaining was a family affair. In just six months, Ellen Wilson organized White House weddings for two of her daughters. I do times two. Every first lady entertained in her own special way. Dolly Madison was one of America's earliest and most fun-loving first ladies. Her weekly receptions were called crushes because so many people filled the White House that they were squeezed together. She served ice cream in special pastry shells that became all the rage. Everyone wanted her recipe. Bet you can't guess her favorite flavor. It was oyster ice cream. These parties weren't just about having a good time. They gave the president and the first lady a chance to meet people, learn about their problems, and figure out ways to help. Dolly made Americans feel welcome at the White House. It must be fun to be so famous, right? Well, not always. If your mom really did become the first lady, photographers would suddenly show up whenever she came to your soccer practice and would follow you both around trying to take your picture everywhere you went. And if you and your mom did something embarrassing by accident, like walk around with a wad of spinach stuck in your teeth or trip and fall on the White House steps, everyone in the country would know about it. Some first ladies really hated all the attention. It was hard even for those who were more comfortable in the spotlight. Frances Cleveland was so popular that her face appeared on everything from playing cards to sewing kits. She was the first first lady to give birth at the White House. One of her daughters supposedly had a candy bar, a baby Ruth, named after her. That's not all. Once a stranger visited the White House, tried to clip off a chunk of baby Ruth's hair as a keepsake. Yikes said, with six kids to look after and lots and lots of pets, Edith Roosevelt oversaw the uh, renovation of the White House that separated the private living spaces from the offices so she didn't have to worry about strangers getting in her kids' way. Louisa, it, Louisa Adams called the White House a dull and 
state and state and stately prison. And Bess Truman wanted to be home in Missouri instead of in the White House. But her husband wrote to her often, relied on her advice, and called her the boss. But it's so cool to live in the White House, right? With its own bowling alley, movie theater, swimming pool, and library, living at the White House is pretty terrific. One president's child rode his bike down the stairs right into a fancy East Room. Zoom! Some played hide and seek in the grand official staterooms, and others hosted slumber parties in the Lincoln bed. But back in the early days, the White House living wasn't quite as great. Abigail Adams, the second first lady, was the first first lady to live at the White House, and she got there before construction was finished. So she hung her laundry to dry in what became the East Room. And then there was the time the British set fire to the White House during the War of 1812. Dolly Madison quickly threw important presidential papers into a famous painting of George Washington in her wagon and escaped in the nick of time. To this day, you can see the burn marks on some of the mansion's entry stones. There were many times over the years when things started to fall apart at the White House, and it was up to the First Ladies to fix them, always making sure to keep the People's House beautiful, welcoming, and true to its historic roots. Jackie Kennedy was well known for her fashion sense, did you, but did you also know that she helped turn the White House into a living museum of the presidency? She loved finding and displaying hidden treasures that told the story of America's past. Fun fact, as wife of the first vice president, Abigail Adams was not just the second first lady. She was also the first second lady. Now there's a twist. Elizabeth Monroe made the White House look like a fancy European palace. Mammy Eisenhower decorated her private room in all pink, pink pillows, pink bath towels, pink furniture, pink flowers, pink hamper, and even a pink garbage can, making it the most popular color of the 1950s. And movers were shocked one day to find Jackie Kennedy, only ever seen in the most elegant clothes, wearing jeans and a sweater to haul and unpack heavy antiques from the back of a truck. Did the First Lady do anything outside of the White House? Yes, a lot. Many First Ladies work hard to make our nation's capital, our country, and the world a safer, healthier, and happier place. During a historic trip to China, Pat Nixon inspired China's leaders to donate two panda bears who made their way to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. When they arrived, she joked about the outbreak of pandemonium. Do first ladies really make a difference? They absolutely do. Do you like to help people? Maybe you and your family have donated your used clothes to people who don't have much to wear. Or maybe you and your classmates have collected food for people who are hungry. First ladies throughout America's history have also tried to make a difference. Sometimes they comforted hurt folks they met, and sometimes they inspired lots of people to help others. During the Re Revolutionary War, Martha Washington stayed in field, uh, in field encampments, nursed injured soldiers, and organized women to roll bandages for their wounds. When she became our first First Lady, Martha, was, Martha met with veterans and former soldiers and their families to let them know how much she and President Washington valued their service to the nation. Eleanor Roosevelt was First Lady during the Great Depression when millions of Americans lost their jobs and many families went hungry or lost their homes. She did lots of new things no other First Lady had ever done before to help as many people as she could. Eleanor traveled around the country learning about the troubles facing the poor, sick, and powerless during World War II. She even trudged through jungles and field hospitals visiting 400,000 American soldiers fighting all over the world. Nellie Taft arranged for the planting of thousands of cherry blossom trees in Washington, D.C. Every spring, they shower the area with delicate pink petals. Lady Bird Johnson made sure that trees, shrubs, and flowers were planted all over Washington, D.C. and all over the country. She even started a children's garden on the White House grounds. World War I was raging while Edith Wilson was First Lady. 
She supported the war effort by decoding secret messages from countries that were America's partners or allies. She also kept a flock of sheep on the South Lawn. They helped keep the grass trimmed and their wool raised money for the Red Cross. Bah! Where else have first ladies traveled and why? First ladies have traveled to every continent on the planet, except for Antarctica, to represent America. And everywhere they went, they met all sorts of people, kings and kids, artists and athletes, patients and pioneers. They visited sparkling palaces, holy temples, makeshift schools, and hospital tents. And they've ridden on everything, including ships, military planes, helicopters, trains, and the backs of elephants and camels. Eleanor Roosevelt even piloted a plane once. Have first ladies tried to help people who were sick or hurt? Yes, staying healthy was a big deal to a lot of first ladies. Early first ladies lived at a time when common infections or colds could turn deadly. So many first ladies were busy caring for sick loved ones or even trying to stay healthy themselves. Today's first ladies encourage people beyond their own families to get healthy in new ways. All of these first ladies and others use their power to teach kids and grown-ups about healthy lifestyles. Nancy Reagan urged kids to just say no to drugs that would harm their bodies. Laura Bush helped millions of people in Africa get life-saving AIDS medicine. This helped hundreds of thousands of babies be born free of the disease. When Betty Ford was struck with breast cancer, she bravely talked about it at a, in a time when most people avoided discussing it, and she inspired women to get examined by doctors. Rosalind Carter got, a, got Congress to make a law helping people with mental illness. For a long time, people felt embarrassed to talk about mental illness, but she tried to change that. Michelle Obama encouraged kids to get active and stay healthy and pushed for all neighborhoods to have a safe, fun place for kids to play. She even invited kids to Washington, D.C. to plant and harvest veggies in the White House kitchen garden. What else do first ladies teach us? Lots of other things. Some were even professional classroom teachers. If you want to be a president, you have to learn to read, write, and speak well. Some presidents learned all of that from their first ladies. Abigail Fillmore was the first first lady to work for pay before she was married. She was a teacher and one of her students, Millard Fillmore, became her husband and president of the United States. She loved reading so much that she helped start the first public library in her town. As first lady, she helped establish the White House Library and kept it stocked with books. Laura Bush was a teacher and a librarian before she met her husband. When she was first lady, she hosted the first national book festival in Washington, DC. Once she even got to read a book with a few special friends on Sesame Street, Big Bird and Elmo. When Florence Harding was a young mother, she earned money by teaching piano lessons. Florence also was the first first lady to have voted for her husband in the 1920 presidential election because before then, for nearly the first 150 years of American history, women in America didn't have the right to vote. Not only was Florence Harding the first first lady to have voted for her husband, she was also the first to get Secret Service protection for the first to ride in an airplane. Grace Coolidge was famous for having a pet raccoon named Rebecca, but she was also a teacher of deaf children and got President Coolidge to pay attention to people with disabilities. Barbara Bush wrote a book starring her dog Millie and gave the money she made from it to programs that teach reading. Eliza Johnson taught her husband, Andrew Johnson, to read and write better. What's the big deal about women's rights anyway? As far back as Abigail Adams, who advised her husband to remember the ladies, there were first ladies who believed that women and girls should have the same rights and opportunities as men and boys, like the right to vote, own property, speak their minds, study any subject they want in school, and work at any job they're qualified for. One of the most famous trailblazers for women and girls around the world is Hillary Clinton. 
Even though some, tra some people tried to stop her, when she was the first lady, she traveled all the way to China to give a speech declaring for the first time that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human's rights once and for all. She has worked hard to make sure that girls everywhere will one day be able to go to school and have the same rights as boys. Seems obvious, right? But women and girls in other parts of the world still don't enjoy the rights we have as Americans, and she was standing up for them. Even first ladies from different backgrounds who held different political beliefs felt that women should be able to vote and the laws for men should be the same as laws for women. Uh, Carrie Harrison helped make sure that, jo that Johns Hopkins School of Medicine accepted women as students so they could become doctors. Lou Hoover was the first woman to graduate from Stanford University with a geology degree. She encouraged young girls to pursue their dreams, which was why she was a big booster of the Girl Scouts and served as its president. Uh, let's see, one is Lady Bird Johnson, Betty Ford, Rosalind Carter, Lou Hoover, Pat Nixon, Julia Grant, Florence Harding, Barbara Bush, Jackie Kennedy, Eleanor Roosevelt, Ellen Wilson, Carrie Harrison, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Nellie Taft, Laura Bush, Michelle Obama, Abigail Adams, Francis Cleveland, and Lucretia Garfield. What are other ways first ladies have stood up for people? Many first ladies have used their influence and power to help people no matter the color of their skin, their religion, or what kind of illness or disability they might have, whether they are men or women, who they love, or where they are from. African Americans were forced to be slaves a long time ago in America. Sadly, many of our presidents and first ladies kept slaves, but Mary Todd Lincoln hated slavery, and in partnership with her husband, President Lincoln, she fought to end it. To show her fellow Americans that color of a person's skin shouldn't matter, Mary was the first First Lady to welcome African Americans to White House as guests. After slavery was outlawed, African Americans still weren't always treated equally, and a number of First Ladies spoke out against racism and all forms of discrimination. Barbara Bush spoke about a lot of issues that people cared about, including discrimination against people with AIDS. She encouraged President Bush to help them. Eleanor Roosevelt felt that all people should be treated fairly and equally. After she left the White House, President Truman chose her to represent America at the United Nations, an organization of all the countries in the world, where she stood up for human rights, supporting freedom, justice, and fairness for all people. When Marian Anderson, a famous opera singer, was banned from a concert hall because she was African American, Eleanor Roosevelt made sure that she got to sing at a much bigger venue, the Lincoln Memorial. Lady Bird Johnson traveled from the country and spoke out, oh, she traveled around the country and spoke out in support of an important law President Johnson signed called the Civil Rights Act, which was designed to make America more fair. What happened to the First Ladies after they leave the White House? Like Eleanor, many First Ladies continued to make a difference after leaving the White House. Betty Ford opened up a health care center to help people recover from drugs and alcohol addiction. And Jackie Kennedy led efforts to preserve historic landmarks like beautiful old buildings and train stations. Among the many firsts that First Ladies accomplished, only one was voted into office herself. Hillary Clinton was the first First Lady to be elected to the U.S. Senate. It says, after years of leaving the White House, Betty Ford helped found a new center to treat people who were addicted to drugs and alcohol. After shoveling a few scoops of dirt at the groundbreaking, she left for real construction, the real construction to the pros. At once, at one of Hillary Clinton's campaign stops, her husband joked that women shouldn't have a strain a stranglehold on the job of first spouse. Sounds like he was ready to be the first first gentleman. But even more extraordinary, she's the first first lady to ever run for president and came close to be being elected the first woman president. 
We're not there yet, but there's no doubt that one day we will have a woman president. And we might even have the first first gentleman. When that happens, what do you think the job of the first gentleman should be? And here is a list of all of the presidents and first ladies of the United States of America. If you want to pause and read that. Then there is an author's note. It says, the story of America's first ladies offers a window into how women lived throughout our nation's history. Of course, first ladies were usually women of great privilege, and as such, their narratives don't reflect the full breadth of women's experiences in America or the challenges most women faced, as they were constrained by convention or law. But these accounts show how an ideological diverse group of women used their symbolic status and power to serve our country and improve people's lives. My own experience working at the White House opened my eyes to the enormous sacrifice, courage, patriotism, and commitment First Ladies bring to their work. I relied on a wide range of excellent sources for this book, a few of which are terrific sources for young readers. The website of the White House Historical Association had lots of excellent information on First Ladies and White House history. Many of the entries on First Ladies that I relied on were written by Alita Black. America's First Ladies, Their Lives and Their Legacy by Lewis L. Gould, The Smithsonian First Ladies Collection by Lisa Kathleen Grady and Amy Pat Paston, First Ladies by D.K. Eyewitness Book, First Ladies, The Saga of the President's Wives and Their Power, Volumes 1 and 2 by Carl Sferrazzo Anthony, America's First Families, by Carl Safaraza Anthony, Secret Lives of the First Ladies by Cormac O'Brien, the website of the National First Ladies Library, Smart About the First Ladies, Smart About History, written and illustrated by John Bueller and Susan Shade, Dana Reagan, Sally Warner, and Jill Weber. Note, I did not capitalize First Lady throughout unless it was used as a title for a specific first lady because we don't capitalize the word president unless it's used as a title for a specific president. The end.